So good evening and welcome to the Faculty of Law <coughs> at the University of Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to see you here. Um, it's a particular privilege for me to introduce tonight's speaker, the Honorable Mr. Justice Lytton. Henry is a graduate of the University of Oxford, graduating from Merton College. I know a little bit about Merton College because 50 years after Henry graduated, it saw fit to make me a fellow. Henry has an enviable reputation as a property lawyer, and Merton claims to be the college that occupies the first parcel of land that was conveyed to establish the University of Oxford. Other colleges dispute that, that Merton has the credentials to claim or to prove its claim as the founding college. Anyway, Henry was called to the bar in 1959 and quickly gained a reputation as a formidable advocate. He took silk in 1970. The next move in what is an illustrious career is that he was appointed directly to the Court of Appeal in 1992, and that's the first such appointment in Hong Kong. He then became, as another first, the first permanent judge of the Court of Final Appeal um, immediately following the handover in 1997. Henry's enjoyed a long and distinguished career at, with his association with the university. Um, in the 1970s, he was co-founder of the Hong Kong Law Journal and for 21 years was its editor-in-chief. His support for the faculty continues, as we can see today, and he's recently been appointed honorary professor. Going beyond this illustrious career, I can also give you a, a small antidote. Um, a story, anecdote about Henry. In the 1970s, there was a major landslide uh, just behind the university campus in a road called, I believe, Coatwell Road, if that's the correct pronunciation. Um, Henry was buried for some 70 hours under the rubble of that landslide, but fortunately for us, especially for tonight, he was rescued eventually. Um, Henry's influence on land law and on conveyancing uh, has been immense. And it's the issue of sales of real property which forms the subject of tonight's lecture. So without further ado, I think we'd like to welcome Mr. Justice Lytton to the floor. Thank you, Professor Lowry, for your kind words. My association with this university has indeed been long and happy, and uh, I've been privileged to be associated in various respects with the Faculty of Law since the late 1960s. And I wish to thank the university in particular now for the facilities which have been accorded to me uh, for the past week or so, which has enabled me to have access to material, which otherwise would have been rather difficult to access, um, and provided me with a most attractive room to work in, and also provided uh, to extremely able law students, both in their fourth year, to help me in the preparation of my lectures, one of whom I'm happy to see is right here in this room, Ivy Ho. Thank you, Ivy. Um, you've got my notes, and uh, I start with two resounding quotations. One uh, from my colleague who's sitting to my left, where he said, doing so without the terms agreed and not by recasting them, the courts strive to uphold the substance and reality of a bargain 
between the parties. Echoing what uh, Lord Hoffman had said earlier in the um, Jumble King case, in what seems to be unequivocal terms, contracts for the sale of land are no, not exceptions to the principle that parties have freedom of contract and may agree to whatever terms they like. But I think uh, as, we'll, the, as this lecture develops, it will be seen that um, those well-rounded propositions of contract law are somewhat modified and that these expressions of principle are not absolute. But then, of course, as all things are in the common law, they are seldom absolute propositions in the law. And in fact, I think uh, quite recently a distinguished Australian judge said that uh, the common law abhors absolutes. Uh, and I think this proposition is well il illustrated when we go a little more deeply into land law in this area. The area that I, I wish to explore in this lecture, I suppose, focuses upon um, what constitutes good title or a blot on title. Of course, always in the context that there are no qualifications to the proposition that the vendor has contracted to pass a good title. Contractually, of course, the matter may be modified, but Without modification, the question is asked simply what constitutes a good title and, and what might be deemed to be lots on title. Now, in relation to the freedom of contract point, um, let me just quote for you terms which existed in a contract, which um, in fact is taken from the case that you see on page 7 of my notes, the case of Rignal development against Halil, which was actually heavily relied upon by the majority of the Court of Appeal of Hong Kong in a case that I'll be dealing with later on, the Chi Kit case. Now, just, let me just quote to you what the parties have contracted in the Rignal development case. The purchaser shall be deemed to have made local searches and inquiries and to have knowledge of all matters that would be disclosed thereby and shall purchase subject to such matters. Now, very plain words with no, no equivocation. And then another provision to the same effect. The property is sold subject to any matters which might be disclosed by a search and or inquiries of the relevant local authorities, etc., then the purchaser shall be deemed to buy with full notice and knowledge of all such matters and shall not raise any objections thereon or requisitions relating thereto. Plain words that leaves no room as to what the parties had contracted in that case. And yet in that case, the vendor was unable to rely upon those contractual provisions and failed uh, at, the, at first instance and there was no appeal from the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Millet. Now, before I actually go into deep, more deeply into the law and a lot of it, I suppose, would be English land law, I, I would perhaps a word of caution, that land law in particular is peculiarly locality sensitive. And, and what might be implied, for example, in a contract, uh, uh, a contract relating to land in the home counties of England may not necessarily be applicable when applied to a flat on the 16th floor a high-rise block in Mong Kok. Uh, 
going to say it's a bad law speech, or, but you know what I mean. Um, and as a matter of vocabulary, I, I sometimes talk in, in court, uh, hearing an appeal, when counsel starts referring to authorities, when they actually mean refer to cases. And instead of authorities, which would, by the very word itself, seek to bind, cases are more illustration of proposition. And this is a distinction which, which I think students should bear in mind. Now, what constitutes a good title? Uh, I've got on page one of the notes what is set out in, in Schedule 1, Part 2, Paragraph 4 of um, the Conveyancing and Property Ordinance, which raises an implied covenant in every assignment that the land may be quietly entered into and during the residue of the term of years created by the government lease held and enjoyed by the purchaser without any lawful interruption or disturbance. Without any lawful interruption or disturbance. And enjoy. Now, these words, as I hope I can develop, cannot be taken too literally. Now, recently in the Court of Final Appeal, we were concerned with a case concerning what is now called the Bank of America Tower, but when first constructed was called Gammon House. And the um, contract for $138 million worth of real estate on the 37th floor of that building was actually a what was called a preliminary sale and purchase agreement providing for a formal agreement which the parties never signed. But the purchaser, in fact, nevertheless paid the full deposit of $13.8 million. Now, when the title deeds were delivered for Peruso by the purchaser solicitor, 96 documents were handed over. And when the purchaser solicitors examined the documents, they were found to be a whole series of previous conveyances of the various there were five units on the on, on, on the 37th floor and there were um, assignments relating to these units and going looking at the older assignments there was then a recital or recitals which said that this assignment is subject to what were called pit pump agreements and pipeline way leave agreements. And when you actually examine the reality of those, what those were, were agreements entered into by the developer of Gammon House back in the mid-1970s in order to ensure that seawater from the harbor could be drawn through pipes and pumped into Gammon House in order to feed the cooling system of the 37-story building. Now, requisitions were made as to these uh, documents by the purchaser of just a few units on the 37th floor of the building. And as a matter of common sense, no one could possibly have uh, expected that the vendor in the 21st century could or would have had those documents in their possession. Why? Because it related to the development of the building at a time when perhaps it was in the ownership of the developer and hasn't, has not yet been subdivided into units 30 years down the line. Now, in the court below, in the courts below, these were treated for some odd reason as documents of title. But when you actually look at what these documents purported to do, 
it could not possibly have affected Tito. And uh, I quote from a brief passage in our judgment in that case, that if the cooling system should have failed for the Bank of America Tower, it would have affected the entire building and all the occupants, and likewise the arrangement for servicing the multi-story office blocks, such as electricity supply, etc., etc. And of these matters, any careful purchaser would, of course, be, have been aware. And uh, presumably, a careful uh, purchaser would have made inquiries as to what provisions have been made. Is there a sinking fund for maintenance of uh, the lifts, uh, maintenance of other services? But when you actually ask yourself, how does this affect the title to the properties on the 37th floor of this building? The answer, quite simply, is well, it doesn't. It's an incident in the management of this building which affects all the occupiers rather than something which touches and concerns the title of ownership of the owners of units on the 37th floor. Now, in the books, there is a distinction made between what is regarded as the quality of the property and the title to the property. But the problem is that when you actually look at decided cases, this distinction is not quite so neat. Quality of the property, yes how well are the lifts maintained, and so on and so forth. Title to the property is the uh, owner, has the owner the right to sell. Is the property encumbered? Is it mortgaged to a bank, etc., etc.? Those are, are the dis distinctions which are, are clear. But in the gray area, it wouldn't be quite so clear. Now, there are really two, as far as I can see, two opposing propositions. And it's embodied really in the two headings on page two of my notes. On the one hand, there's the maxim, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. And if you look at the leading textbook on the subject, Spencer Bauer's second edition, edited by Turner and Sutton, there's this round statement, unequivocal, quote, current opinion among textbook writers, experts in the subject, is unanimous in the view that the maxim, caveat emptor, is unreservedly applicable to con contracts for the sale of land as regards defects in quality or enjoyment of the property sold. Now, enjoyment of the property sold could well, of course, encompass a host, host of things, whether the lifts work. If they don't, how do you access your units on the 37th floor? If the cooling system failed in mid-August, how do you use your room, etc., etc.? So, again, a proposition like that cannot be t t just taken at face value. On the other hand, on the, the, on the, 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 um, the other part of the equation is the proposition, uh, as stated by Mr. Justice Bukhari and, Mr. and Sir Anthony Mason in their joint judgment in the Chi Kit case, quotes, the burdens on the vendor to prove a good title with a very high standard of proof beyond reasonable doubt the purchaser will not be at risk of a successful assertion against him of an encumbrance. The vendor discharges his obligation if he shows to that standard that he's in a position to convey the estate of interest contracted to be sold without any blot or possibility of litigation to the purchaser. Hence this, this expression, blot on title. The um, analysis of the case law, as I mentioned earlier, seems to hover between these two extremes. Now, Spencer Bauer 
seems to have no doubt as to what the position is. He divides defects in title. Not, not defects in the quality of the property, but defects in title into four classes. One, the vendor has no title to the property. Straightforward. Two, the vendor's title, though he has one, is different in some material respect from that which the purchaser entitled expects from the terms of his contract. Three, the title is encumbered, whereby his use and enjoyment of the land is detrimentally affected or restricted. And four, the vendor's title is affected by some notice or order served on the vendor by some lawful authority. And generally speaking, the case law that, that uh, we are concerned with and cases which come before the courts in Hong Kong really fall within categories three and four. Encumbrance and um, notices from some government authority, usually the building authority under the building's ordinance. Now, I, I refer to three cases here on page three of my notes, really just to get them out of the way, because they are really, in a sense, cases on the extreme of the analysis that we're, we're, we're endeavoring to uh, engage in. Because, as I, I see it, there's really no ambiguity in any of those three cases. The Jumbo King case was in relation to a very well-known landmark in, in, in Kowloon, the Hankow Center, which began life as J. Hotung House. Now, the occupation permit of that was issued in February 1968. Um, and it related to, to um, generally speaking, a number, the, the contract related to quite a number of shops on the ground floor, although, in fact, it, it also encompassed a few utility rooms the upper floors, but generally speaking, sale of shops on the ground floor. And um, when we actually look at the facts of the case, you see that what happened there was that uh, before contract, the purchaser had inspected the property and knew that there were extensive cock lofts on the ground floor shops which were accessible by steel staircases and in the case of one unit, G7 a small goods lift connected the ground floor with a cock loft now the area, these were very extensive uh, cock lofts the area of the cock lofts was about 32% of the entire total floor area of the shops agreed to be sold. So it is not something which was, as it were, the minimus. But there were extensive clauses in the contract which made no doubt as to what the vendor was purporting to sell. There was, for example, a clause which says that the vendor warrants and declares has not received any notices from government, etc., etc., and then goes on to say he does not warrant or represent that each and every structure on the property has been erected in compliance with the building ordinance. Uh, the vendor shall be under no liability, whatever, if it is discovered at any time that there were unauthorized structures. And then goes on to say the purchase, the purchaser shall not be entitled to raise any requisition or objection or rescind this agreement uh, to, or by reason in connection with any such contravention. Now, the, there's no suggestion, in fact, that um, the vendor knew of any unauthorized stru structures there. And in fact, when the first requisitions were raised, they did not even raise the question of a possibility So the way we approach the case in, in, the, court of, in the, um, the Court of Appeal in that case was to say, well, the, the evidence was neutral. There's a possibility that some, maybe even all, of these cock lofts 
access by two staircases might have been additions after the occupation permit. But since the matter was never explored, no, no one um, ra raised any issue until very late in the process of requisition. Um, the, the evidence is neutral, and the situation was well and truly covered by these exemption clauses. And I, I don't think that anyone doubts the rightness of that position. The second case is even more interesting, the Active Keen case. Now, that occupation permit was rather earlier than the permit in the J. Ho Tung House case. That occupation permit was January 1964, um, before the time of, of the Cultural Revolution spilling over eventually to Hong Kong and causing riots. 66, and the contract related to the sale of one small flat, flat C on the ninth floor of a 12 story building. Now, and there were nine flats on that floor. But when you look at the occupation permit, it says permitted to occupy the building, blah, 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 seven tenements each for domestic use. So it looks as if sometime after the occupation permit, somebody has somehow reconfigured the partitions, etc., of the ninth floor and created nine flats where the occupation permit referred to seven flats. And there was no evidence before us anyway as to whether what happens to each of the other floors. Quite possibly every floor has been thus altered. Um, and nobody knows. Now, there was no question of any unauthorized alterations within flat C, which was the subject matter of the sale. And the question was, was there any risk then to the vendor of some form of enforcement action by a government agency on, on the suspicion, and no more than that, of, the, of, unor of unauthorized alteration? And if so, what were these alterations? How did the, the um, situation materialize in that way? Well, the answer is that the only possible action that could be taken would be breach of um, the conditions of the Crown lease, uh, or alternatively, I suppose, to say that the entire building has been uh, uh, that there has been alteration to the entire building. The only way to deal with the situation, to rectify it, put it right, is to have the building torn down. What, arising out of a, a, a sale of a small flat on the ninth floor, the consequence is that the whole building's got to be torn down? Uh, it seems outrageous to even suggest that. So the case was then approached on the basis that, look, um, there's simply no possibility or no real risk of enforcement against the, uh, the vendor. And um, the last case in, in, this, um, in my notes is even an earlier case, and that refers to the Repulse Bay Mansion Block C. Um, and the occupation permit for that building was in June 1955. And there, there seems no doubt whatever that the block was built in contravention of a height restriction of 35 feet. And in this regard, the, um, the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Bukhari, I think, is worth quoting in full because he approached the issue square on with no equivocation he says quotes in my view the evidence in this case did not exclude a reasonable possibility of an unwaived breach of condition which gives the government a right of re-entry the question is therefore whether assuming that the government has the right there is any real risk that it would actually take 
drastic step of enforcing it to the detriment of innocent owners. I entirely agree with Lytton. The correct answer is the negative. It is simply not in the nature of good government to harm innocent people unnecessarily like that. Accordingly, it is safe to proceed on the basis that the government would never do so. I would suggest a, a clarion call to solicitors to obey their common sense. Now, I, I really put these three cases out of the way because it do doesn't really bear any further analysis and creates no problems in, in my opinion. On page four, I set out the proposition again. The general principle is well known that as from the date of the contract of the sale of land, if anything happens to the estate between the time of sale and the time of completion, cause without the vendor's default, it is at the risk of the purchaser. And that's the quotation from the T. Kidd case, which I'll deal with more fully. The question is, um, how solid is this principle in Hong Kong? It certainly is, is uh, solid in Australia, as it is demonstrated by the case of Fletcher and Manton, which concerned the sale of land in Melbourne with a row of dilapidated terrace houses. The contract was made on the 21st of March for settlement three months later. Now, unknown to the parties, the Housing Commission of the State of Victoria had made a declaration on the 8th of March that the houses were unfit for habitation and required them to be demolished. But in fact, and uh, I've omitted it from my printed notes, the effective service of the declaration was never made on the vendor, and you knew nothing about this declaration until early April. Some two weeks or so after he had entered into the contract to sell the land with the houses. And then on the 28th of March, the purchaser made requisition, including question whether there were any outstanding notices or orders relating to the property, and a requisition that, if so, they should be complied with. And there was a long gap in time, and in early May, the vendor gave a formal reply saying, since the date of the contract, a demolition order has been received and complied with, and the houses have been demolished. And uh, the purchaser refused to accept title and demanded the repayment of his deposit. His case was rejected by the trial judge. The loss fell on the purchaser. No demolition order attached to the ownership of the land until after the contract was made by a majority his judgment was upheld. The dissenting judgment of the acting Chief Justice is interesting. He says the, cru shu the crucial question was at what point in time did any visibility attach to the use of the property and the enjoyment of the estate? Uh, his conclusion was that under the scheme of the Act, which is entitled Slum Reclamation and Housing Act, the Commissioner's declaration operated, as he puts it, in rem and attached an immediate visibility on the premises. Quite an inter interesting proposition. But in the majority judgment given by Mr. Justice Owen Dixon, the point of emphasis, emphasis was that, look, the parties were contracting with their eyes open. They knew that this was slum property, liable to subject to orders under the Slum Clearance Act, and the purchaser therefore took the risk that at any time a notice might have been uh, served under that act. Now, if this line of reasoning is appropriate, then it could be that when you're dealing with buildings erected in the 1950s, 1960s, uh, such as the cases that I've just referred to, the Hankow Center House, the small flat in Kowloon, the Pulse Bay Mansion. Um, uh, notoriously, I think everyone knows that 
there were, in fact, a lot of um, irregularities affecting um, the lands department at that time, long before the ICAC was established. And a well-advised purchaser might well expect that in such a building there would be structures such as cock locks, balconies, etc., erected in contravention of the building's ordinance. But I've never yet uh, seen council arguing this point in any of the cases that uh, I've either read or, or, or dealt with myself as a judge. And um, I give uh, as an example, I think, of uh, how I was going to say the profession seems to be wedded to authority rather than to reality on the ground. And I would respectfully suggest to students that when you come to be advocates, go to the facts of the case and perhaps even the merits of the case as appear from the facts before you resort to so-called authorities. Authorities are useful as examples of principles, but ultimately facts drive the conclusion of a case. Now, in this um, Lucky Dragon case, that concerned a ground floor shop in Elgin Street, which in the old days was a very depressed part of town. The occupation permit, January 1966 the riots. An internal staircase had been removed. The stair, well, it, it re referred to a ground floor shop. Uh, internal staircase removed. The stairwell had been slabbed over. An internal staircase, um, uh, and sorry, the, the, the void, which had been left by a cock loft, has also been slabbed over. So, you, in effect, you created an extra floor from, from the, the cock loft. And these conditions, from the evidence, had existed for 40 years. The cock loft was owned in common ownership, not only by the vendor, but by somebody else as well. So, any reinstatement of the premises to accord with approved plans would have involved that third party owner. The building authority was well aware of the situation and had stated in writing that the unauthorized building works did not warrant prioritized enforcement action, but advisory letters would be sent out to owners, whatever that meant. And the Court of Appeal upheld the trial judge, found that there was a real risk of enforcement action. And as uh, Justice of Appeal Le Pichon said, the building authority's policy could change hence there was a defect which went to the root of the vendor's title. Well, obviously, counsel representing the vendor had not drawn the judge's attention to what appears to be the clear policy of the lands department in relation to what are called UBW, unauthorized building work. And I looked at uh, this morning the 2013 Hong Kong government report at page 199. You see this statement to the effect that since the year 2011, the building department's efforts on UBW, unauthorized building works, are focused on things erected on the exterior building. And then if you go to the website of the uh, lands department, you find um, this statement by the um, chief secretary, Mrs. Carrie Lam, in answer to a question from a legislative councillor, quotes, in the decades since the year 2001, the building de uh, department has focused its enforcement action on high priority targets. These include UBW, Unauthorized Building Works, which present obvious hazard or immediate danger to life or property, newly built um, unauthorized works, or those such as large canopies, 
large supporting frames for air conditioners, unauthorized building works on rooftops of single staircase buildings and UPWs on canopies or cantilevered slab balconies. So the idea that um, where the building authority had actually said in so many terms that this is not a case of prioritized enforcement and using bureaucratic language means in effect that for the foreseeable future there's no question of any action being taken in relation to this um, covered up this is a slab which um, uh, has um, eliminated the void and uh, the removal uh, and the, the um, removal of the staircase particularly because it affects not only the immediate party to the case but also of course the third party um, and in any case I would contrast the Lucky Dragon case with a case in, in Australia again in the state of Victoria the case of McInnes and Edwards where there were undoubted illegal building alterations to a house and the judge they held that whilst an order imposing the burden of reinstatement would constitute a latent defect in title the mere existence of circumstances creating a risk even a probability that the property would in future be subject to statutory charge was not enough. Now, obviously, where a demolition order has been served on the vendor, that would constitute a blot on title unless the contract made specific provision uh, that the purchaser accepted title with that blemish. But um, I think, as you can see, the distinction between defect in quality of the property and the defect in title is somewhat blurred. And uh, I think that distinction is blurred even further when we look at the case of Chi Kit and Lucky Health. Now, that was a case where the sale uh, was sale by tender. Um, where the documents of title were made available for inspection by prospective purchasers and there was no requisition raised at all and on the face of things the vendor's title was wholly unimpeachable. The, the um, property comprised both uh, commercial and domestic units and also something like 53 I think car parking spaces in Sun Hing building in Kowloon now the contract was made on the 19th of August 1997 for completion on the 20th of November 1997 some three and a half years before then an action had been instituted against the incorporated owners of the building arising out of an action brought by a workman who had fallen uh, off a bamboo scaffolding in um, the back part of the building, the common part and had severely injured himself and was rendered uh, quadriplegic and he brought an action against the incorporate owners for damages for personal injuries uh, and occupied liability and uh, four days before the contract the committee of the corporation had sent out a memo to all the owners uh, saying that the case brought against them by the owner, by, by the um, workman, uh, was set for hearing, and substantial lawyers' fees had to be collected. And the trial actually began on the 6th of October. And then, very quickly, the judge gave judgment for 25.7 million plus interest plus costs which would have made the bill well over $30 million. It was a record sum. Much prominence was given to it in the news media. And of course, the corporation did not have the means to pay. Um, 
settlement was imminent, as you can see, it was on the 20th of November that the uh, sale was to be settled. And at the beginning of November, the vendor made an offer to set aside 4 million from the purchase price to be held by solicitors, which was their estimate of their proportion liability uh, of the 30 million. The offer was rejected, and in rejecting the offer, the purchaser solicitor pointed out the provisions of section 171B of the Building Management Ordinance, whereby a judgment creditor was entitled to apply to the court to levy execution to enforce a judgment against uh, any, any owner, and not necessarily proportionate to the owner's uh, share of the building. So the um, purchaser refused to complete and asked for the return of the deposit. And I seek to summarize the effect of the judgment of uh, Mr. Justice Bukhari and Sir Anthony Mason, with which the other three judges agreed to this effect. One, the workman's judgment globally for over 30 million entered before the date fixed for completion rendered it certain it wasn't a possibility, it was a certainty that very substantial liability would attach to an owner because the corporation was unable to discharge that sum two, the liability arose from the use and occupation of the common part of the building and therefore affected every owner it ran with the land if it was not, of course, if the judgment wasn't satisfied by the corporation's own resources. Three, that liability was such of such magnitude as to exceed any reasonable purchaser, sorry, as to exceed what any reasonable purchaser might be expected to have in contemplation, and hence it affected the title of the owner, and it, the defect, of course, was uh, latent, not taken. There's a very interesting dissenting judgment of Mr. Justice Rogers in the Court of Appeal. And he reasoned thus. The judgment obtained by the workman of the 30th October was against the corporation only, self-evident. The liability was that of the corporation alone, constituted no encumbrance on any owner's title. Until an event such as the grant of leave to execute levy execution against an owner under section 171b uh, there could be no encumbrance on the vendor's title or defect in that title now such reasoning would be in line with the judgment of the High Court of Australia in Fletcher and Manton that I've just um, uh, referred you to the majority judgment in the Court of Appeal was based upon the reasoning in a case called Rignal Development and Halil and I find it a little difficult to understand how that reasoning accorded re really with the circumstance of the Chikit case. In that case a, um, it was a sale of a house um, in Peckham which was a poor, poor um, suburb of London. A previous owner of the house had obtained from the local authority an improvement grant. There's a complex um, statutory scheme for improvement of residential properties and if you do obtain a grant you have then to pledge to let the property out to tenant for I think a period of at least five years. The idea being to provide housing adequate housing for people uh, who couldn't afford to buy in the poorer suburbs of London. Anyway, there was an improvement grant which was registered as a land charge in the local registry and after the period when um, the property had to be let to tenant, it could be discharged but only by payment. Um, and the, own, the, um, the vendor in the case, Mrs. Halil, 
bought the house from the owner. Now, I said she knew of the charge. Actually, that's, that's a bit wrong. Her solicitor knew of the charge. She herself, I think, did not know of the charge. Um, but uh, the solicitor's knowledge, being her agent, was attributed to her. Later, she entered into a contract with Rignal Development to sell the house. The contract stipulated that the purchaser was deemed to have made local searches, etc., in terms which I read out to you at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, and there's no doubt as to what the vendor was seeking to do, that um, uh, you are at risk if you don't uh, inspect. Um, it's up to you. Uh, I let you know plainly that um, uh, I do not make any representation that there are no charges. Uh, it's up to you to, to, to do the searches and caveat emptor in the day. The purchaser entered into the contract without making a, a search, and, but when it learned that there was, in fact, this improvement uh, charge, it refused to complete until it was removed by payment by the vendor. Now, Mr. Justice Millett's judgment was to this effect. One, equity bound the vendor to disclose all defects in title of which she was aware. Two, she could not rely on the condition of sale that the purchaser was deemed to have searched the register and therefore had bought the property subject to the encumbrance. And as the vendor had made no disclosure, the purchaser succeeded. What's interesting is his his reasoning. He starts off uh, by saying this. Um, for 60 years, since the judgment of Mr. Justice Eve in Fossey and Holborn's contract in 1927, prudent purchasers have searched the local register of land charges before contract, but recently the time taken by local authorities in London to reply to inquiries, deal with applications for local searches, had become a scandal which threatened to impede the proper working of a free market. And the circumstance therefore robbed, in effect, the um, contract of its, um, of, of its uh, provisions, of, of its force. Um, now, the, um, what I find really interesting is this. The court, in effect, imposes an obligation of candor on vendors. And what I think the court is saying in the regional development case and in similar cases I may refer to them, um, is this, that look, if there is a problem, or there may be a problem, you've got two ways of dealing with it. One is to put into your contract these tricky clauses, we've seen some of them, how it's worded, to, uh, to the effect that uh, you make no representations, the actual wording in the Rignal case was um, the property is subject to uh, so subject to any matters which might be disclosed by a search and or inquiries of the relevant local authorities, the purchaser shall be deemed by with full notice the knowledge of all such matters and shall raise no objections, etc. Now, what the court is saying in effect is, well, now if you put all that into your contract are you actually saying to the prospective purchaser, well, there is a problem, or there may be a problem? Because if there is no problem, why put such provision into your contract? But if there is or may be a problem, why don't you be frank about it, come out in the open, tell the purchaser what the problem is, full disclosure, and you don't need these tricky clauses. And therefore, court in effect overrides these exemption clauses, whether it be full exemption or in other cases 
be exempt by imposing a strict time limit on requisitions and uh, override by a duty of full and frank disclosure. Now, I don't think the, war, the law has actually evolved to the extent of making this a proposition of law that overrides your freedom of contract. But certainly, as far as I can see, it comes pretty close to it. And I, I would perhaps like to end this lecture um, by um, a clarion call from the rooftop for the triumph of common sense. And that, I think, is exemplified in the um, Court of Final Appeals case in Marina International Hotels against Atlas Limited, which was uh, reported in uh, 2007. The case involved other matters such as um, what constituted practical completion of a hotel, etc., etc., with which uh, this lecture is not concerned. But there were three matters raised by way of objection by the purchaser, which the purchaser argued affected the title of the vendor in the case. One, there were openings, there were holes um, drilled in the roof slab after the uh, occupation permit, which were to accommodate the chilled water pipes, which would feed the air conditioning system of the hotel. That's number one, holes through the roof slab. Two, there were concrete plinths, as they were called, laid on the roof in order to spread the load of the presumably pretty heavy chilled water cooling plants, which had to be put there for the purpose of air conditioning. And three, there were posts which were erected on the roof to support the gondolas which are used for the cleaning of the facades of the hotels. And the question was whether these came within the exemption of uh, under the Buildings Ordinance, Section 41.3, to this effect, building works not involving the structure of any building may be carried out in any building without application or approval application to or approval from, from the building authority. Now, so the question was whether these building works, drilling the hose, putting the plinths, erecting the posts, were um, building works not involving a structure in the building. Justice Bukhari's judgment with which all the other judges agreed said in effect and I'm passing him exercise common sense one opening up the holes simply um, did not affect it was not a structural work of any kind in a story as far as the laying of the concrete plinths and putting up the posts were concerned, yes, they did involve structure, and thereby differing in effect from the judgment of the Court of Appeal, that I think uh, rather tended to stretch the meaning of structure, or rather confine the meaning of structure too narrowly. But the Court of Final Appeal said, in these circumstances, examined the, 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 the circumstances there was no risk of enforcement action and I, I would regard that I think as the triumph of common sense and um, I, I would perhaps end this lecture um, by reminding students who some of whom hopefully will be successful in practicing solicitors before too long, reminding them of um, what some years ago uh, Mr. Justice Fuad had said 
that um, whilst purchasers are fully entitled to insist upon their legal rights, whatever their motives for seeking to withdraw from their agreements, they should not be surprised if their, to put it, the list of condemnations is very carefully scrutinized, where in the absence of any inclination by the vendor to vary their bargain, the purchasers were so obviously looking for excuses not to complete. Now this, again, I think is a, a draft of common sense in an area which so often is encrusted with obfuscations. Thank you. I'm pleased to say that um, Mr. Justice Lytton has very kindly agreed to take questions from the floor. And so the floor is now open to you. Yes, Malcolm. Would it be going too far to say that one uh, lesson to, from tonight's lecture is that you regard the law regarding the effect of the presence of UBWs on, on the property, on the, the title, the vendor's title, as being ripe for consideration by the Court of Final Appeal? I thought we've considered it on quite a number of occasions. Not, di not directly, no. In fact, um, Mr. Justice Bakari has said that it's too late to consider it. That was in Cheek Hit. I suppose whenever you have a grey area like this and is a matter of degree then inevitably the law is uncertain because the grey area is, is, is pretty wide and as I, I mentioned uh, the Lucky Dragon case where, where you've got um, illegal structures or illegal or unauthorized works which must have been at least 40 years before and tenants have been occupying those premises with, in that situation for 40 years to categorize it as unauthor unauthorized works and liable or enforcement action I would, I would suggest just simply stretches the proposition of real risk too far I, I, but I, it's a matter of judgment well I thoroughly agree but, but there is a test laid down by the court of appeal and that, that is really what I'm suggesting needs to be reconsidered in the case called Sparkrich and Valrose where, where I appeared in fact and tried to persuade the Court of Appeal that the guidelines which you read out, which haven't changed very much over the years of the building authority, prioritized enforcement, meant if it wasn't high priority, it didn't affect title. And I got nowhere. I got a very robust response from Mr. Justice Rogers and a slightly more, more mellow but still firm response from Mr. Justice Godfrey. Well, this is perhaps where I think the administration of the law has to be really from grassroots up rather than from the summit of the system down. Because it's really the perception of those who are dealing with these questions day in and day out which really should fashion the, 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 the boundaries rather than the court of final appeal decreeing as a matter of law that they've got it wrong see that, 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 that is the problem 
if it comes to the Court of a Final Appeal, it's very difficult, I think, for the Court of Final Appeal, where it's clearly a case, I mean, how real is the risk, is the question, isn't it? For the Court of Final Appeal to say, well, as a matter of law, you've got it wrong. Well, I think the Court of Final Appeal did say so in, in the, uh, the Marina International uh, case. And, and that perhaps hopefully provides some guidance to the courts below who are administering the system. It's not the Court of Final Appeal that actually is at the co-face. It's the Court's first instance and the Court of Appeal which is at the, at the co-face. In fact, you know, I, I, I rather um, theoretically say that well, the best judges really should be this instance in the, in the Court of Appeal. And, 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 uh, because that's where, that's where the real work of the administration of justice is done. And I suspect that's probably why Lord Dinning, having served four years in the House of Lords, decided to go back to the Court of Appeal and become Master of the Road. Does that answer your question? Well, I've got some other points, but perhaps we can do that in private conversation. I don't want to monopolise the question. I have to say, um, I found this rather depressing, stimulating, since I'm not a property lawyer, but very depressing. I come from a jurisdiction where, because of its connections to the EU, that old-fashioned common law maxim, caveat emptor, has been under attack, not just in real property contracts, but contracts for services and contracts for goods. And so there's been this recalibration amongst the English and the Welsh in terms of rethinking their whole approach to caveat emptor. It doesn't really exist. And I thought the last bastion is the place I need to go to only to learn this evening that the idea is now under attack here as well. But I do want to thank you for a stimulating lecture, Henry. I, as I said, I'm a commercial lawyer. I'm not a conveyancer. Um, but I found the issues that you raised tonight um, absolutely stimulating. And it's probably going to move me to revisit some property law after some 40 odd years. So thank you very much. Um, just one point by way of publicity. Part two, if you like, of tonight's event takes place uh, next Tuesday, the 8th of um, November, um, where Henry will be coming back for a return match so to speak so I, I very much hope um, you'll join us for that event in a week's time